Hi everyone, welcome to Five Quote Shakespeare Hamlet Theme and Conflict Analysis. In this series we'll look at a total of 14 different themes and today we'll look at remembrance, self versus the past. What I do in each video is first identify the important aspects of the theme and apply it to the play. That's our claim. And then we dig into the text and pull out several quotes that make the connection. If you find these videos useful, please like and subscribe. And if you make a donation, you'll get a complete set of the PDFs I use in this series. See the description for details. Remembrance, Ghosts of the Past, is a massive theme, so it, it'll be helpful to break it down into three units. We'll examine it at the macro level, the mezzo level, and the micro level. The micro level is the interesting one. That's when we look at the psychologies and how it impacts the, uh, the, the each character personally. So you can check the timestamps for that, by the way, if you, if you just want to jump forward to how remembrance affects each individual character. The central claim, though, is that everyone in some way is at war with the past. The past is indeed present. Things that happened in the past, events that happened in the past are impacting very, very dramatically on the lives of the people in the present. So a staple antagonist of tragedy, remembrance the past, is indeed a force that influences, directs, and conflicts with the lives of all major characters in this play. Uh, it can be understood by examining how it works at three different levels, as I've said. So I'm going to go into these in a little more detail in a second, but let me just give you a quick overview. Uh, at the cosmic level, the macro level, the past crimes cause a disturbance in the great chain of being. And you can go back and watch my, uh, my Wasteland video on that and you'll, you'll get a bit more detail on that. But I'll, I'll touch on it today. We're going to look at the Great Chain of Being briefly today and find some evidence. Uh, at the mezzo level, you can think of the mezzo level, the mid middle level. We got the cosmic level is the macro level. The mezzo level is the political social level, do you see? And the past war leads to a cycle of war revenge and current war prepara preparations and Norway's eventual annexation by Denmark. So Fortinbras is the, uh, the Norwegian uh, hothead who's threatening Denmark, if you remember uh, that the opening of the play that this this was a very important social and political issue uh, and the past as we've just seen uh, impacts greatly on that as I said the micro level is the most interesting one that's a psychological personal level and past events or memories especially memories of course of those events force unwanted action and emotionally haunt and torment almost everyone except of course for Claudius because he's a sociopath and he's not tormented by anything uh, at the character level, at the micro level, this is, this is where things are going to get interesting. And as I said, have a look at the timestamps if you need to. All characters are in some way psychologically in conflict with memory and uh, the past. You can use the timestamps if you need them. But first, let's see how the past is present at the macro level. The Great Chain of Being, if you go back and watch my video, there's more information about that there. But the Great Chain of Being was the Elizabethan cosmology. It's how they understood the universe to exist. God was in his heaven, and under God there was the king, and the king is the conduit through which God's grace and goodness enters the universe, do you see? And if you remember your Macbeth and your Julius Caesar, if you unlawfully, unnaturally usurp that that position, if you take out the king unnaturally, then God's grace is cut off. It can't enter the universe. And literally, the agents of hell are given free reign on earth because God's grace is no longer present, do you see? So that very much applies to this play. The fratricide, regicide of the king, of King Hamlet by Claudius, it has created that wasteland in Denmark, do you see? Go back and watch that video. There's more about that. Um, this is very much related, very, very similar to a play called Oedipus Rex. Uh, in that place, an ancient Greek, Greek play, and Oedipus, uh, he murdered his father and married his mother. He didn't know that, that they were his parents, and he has children by his mother. So there's a corruption. There, there's a disruption in the natural order of existence, do you see? And the interesting thing for our purposes here, for our theme of remembrance and the, and the ghosts of the past, is that past events will continue to reverberate in and conflict with the present. That's what happens. Something big happens in the past, and the past doesn't go away. It stays in the present until the hero comes along and solves the problem, DC. It remains in conflict with the present until correction is made, usually by the hero. That's the Wasteland Hero theme. Go back and watch my video. Uh, it disrupts the natural order and harmony of the universe and society, and it results in decay and chaos at a spiritual level, moral level, physical level, and political level. Yes, very, very big stuff. Now, Shakespeare takes great pains to establish this very, very early in Act 1 of the, of the play. Here we see Horatio, Horatio when he sees uh, the ghost of, uh, of Hamlet's father, King Hamlet, arrive. He says, this ghost bodes some strange eruption to our state, do you see? So that's, he, he, he senses 
already the rumblings of something uh, uh, gone awry. Marcellus agrees. He says something is rotten in the state of Denmark. That's that famous, uh, the famous uh, Shakespearean quote that you might have heard before. And Hamlet says later on, when he, he, after he talks to the ghost of his father, and the father says, remember me, and we're going to talk about that today because that's, that's central to our theme of remembrance, ghosts of the past. King, Hamlet's father says, remember me, put your life on hold to get revenge for me. And Hamlet says, yes. I, thy poor ghost, while memory holds a seat in this distracted globe, I will remember you, DC. Now, there's a triple pun here on distracted globe. The, the globe was the globe theater, so at the simplest level, it's kind of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge to the audience. He's looking at his audience and saying, you know, in this distracted globe, you bunch of crazy people watching this play, yes, uh, while memory holds a seat here, I, I will get my revenge. But globe also means his, his, his mind, and many actors actually uh, uh, do that. When, he said, when Hamlet says this line, they'll take in this distract, while memory holds a seat in this distracted globe, do you see? Uh, now, for our purposes here at the macrocosmic level, the globe also means, uh, of course, the earth, and that's the macro level of society, and the earth is indeed distracted. It is a wasteland. Okay, that's the macro level. Let's have a quick look at the mezzo level. Events in the past very, very much drive events in the present at the social and political level. In fact, they, 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 they underpin the entire plot of the play. So 30 years ago, old King Fortinbras of Norway was killed by old King Hamlet of Denmark. So there, was a, there, was, there were wars uh, many, many years ago, uh, and Denmark won, and they took over some lands of, uh, from Norway. But as history goes... Memory is long in history. We don't have to look very far to, to see evidence of that in the real world, right? Um, so remembering the loss, the insult, the humiliation, the young, decisive Fortinbras seeks revenge in the present, do you see? So introduced at the beginning and revisited at the end, this remembrance ensures the conflict continues, underpinning the entire pl plot of the play. So just like in real life, sadly, uh, past events dictate what happens in the present, and it's very often not very nice stuff. So we see evidence of this, of course, early on uh, when 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 Shakespeare is establishing the wasteland. He he introduces the theme, uh, this political theme uh, that rumbles underneath the surface of the entire uh, of the entire play. So Horatio explains the situation, the political background. He says, our valiant King Hamlet did slay this King Fortinbras. Now the young Fortinbras. Uh, seeks to recover those foresaid lands so lost by his father. So there's the revenge theme at at uh, at the first at the at the mezzo level DC. So remembrance brings past conflict to the present. Now at the end, of course, when everybody in Denmark is dead, uh, Fortinbras from Norway walks onto the stage and he says, "Yeah, I have some rights of memory in this kingdom, DC, which now to claim my vantage doth invite me." So the past comes full circle to the present. All right, and now at the micro level, the interesting part, we're going to break this down character by character. So we'll start with Hamlet, of course. There are four ways we can look at uh, the impact of the past and remembrance on Hamlet's life. And the most obvious is, is revenge as memory, of course, because that's what this play is. It's a revenge plot. Uh, Hamlet's life is hijacked and haunted by the past. It's, it, it's, there's a past deathbed promise to someone. And once, once, once someone makes a deathbed promise, it's really, really hard to escape from that, do you see? Uh, and it's worse than a deathbed promise because it's, it's actually a ghost that comes back and says, you know, remember me me and put your life on hold for my sake, do you see? So his life is hijacked by that past promise to the father. Revenge, of course, is a form of enslavement to remembering. Now, you might have seen movies or read books where this is very much uh, a, a part of the problem of revenge. Yes, there's a desire for revenge, but the whole story, the whole plot of the, of the movie or the play or, or the, the novel deals with the hero trying to get revenge. And when he finally gets revenge, it's an empty victory, do you see? Because he, 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 he's at the end of his life or near the end of his life or middle-aged or whatever it is, and he spent his whole 40 years or whatever doing nothing but, uh, uh, but trying to get revenge. And now that he's got revenge, there's nothing left. His life is completely empty, DC, or her life is completely empty. Um, so so that, that revenge as a form of enslavement to remember, remembering, it prevents participation in the here and now of one's own life. Your life is put on hold for the needs of somebody else that's not even alive anymore, do you see? So it, it, re it really is an interesting uh, a plot device in that regard. So Hamlet's present as a student is in direct conflict with the demands of his father's past. He's a student. 
I've mentioned in many of my videos, he's, a, he's an artsy, he's a nerdy, he's a bookish, he's a philosophical, he's an introspective kind of guy. And that's where he belongs in that milieu back at university in the artsy world or the academic world or in the world of philosophy, in the world of ideas, that's where he belongs. But he's thrown into this uh, more active physical heroic mode, political mode too, uh, that he's not suited for. Okay, so here's the evidence for it. Very, very early, of course, the ghost comes on and says, remember me, and Hamlet, as we've already seen, says, sure, I'll remember you, Dad, and thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain. Now, I've mentioned this in another video as well, that the reason why Hamlet uh, uses this as a metaphor, I will erase from the book and volume of my brain everything except your commands, do you see? So I just point that out again to, to demonstrate that, yes, he has a life. He off stage before the play begins, he has a life that he's living DC and that's all gone to pieces now. That is the Hamlet that he had known, that we might have known in a different play, is now gone and he is this tool for revenge DC. So that's how the past has a grip. The past has such a, a vicious grip on this poor boy in the present. Uh, so the ghost, uh, in the middle now, uh, when the ghost returns in that terrible bedroom scene with wonderfully terrible de bedroom scene with uh, uh, Hamlet and his mother, Mother, the ghost comes back and he says, "Say, uh, sorry." The ghost comes back and he says, uh, I'm, "I'm here." Yeah, let me jump down here. This visitation is but to wet thy almost blunted purpose. Do you see? So, it, it, as much as we psychologically, we've we've experienced bad things in the past, we've done bad things in the past that we regret, and we can never, never escape them. Do you see? This is what's happening here. He's made this promise to his father in the past, and now he can't escape it. The past comes back. Now, there's a suggestion here. Gertrude in this scene can't see the ghost, and so Hamlet's implication is, uh, uh, Shakespeare's implication is that maybe it's just a figment of Hamlet's imagination, which happens to all of us. The, these ghosts, you know, while we're in a quiet moment on a train or something, we're remembering things in the past that we don't necessarily want to remember but here they are that we're stuck with them and so this is what happens the ghosts come back and the visitation is to wet Hamlet's almost blunted purpose personification of memory that's the personification of memory DC of promises and the chains of obligation that we have now when Hamlet encounters that he, when he first sees the ghost before he says this but when, when, and when he first sees the ghost that when the ghost first enters he's terrified absolutely terrified. He says, save me and hover o'er me with your wings, you heavenly guard. So he's calling on the angels to protect him from this vision of the past. Do you see how devastating that is? So I just, I, that's, this is all good evidence to show how, how in, imprisoned by the past that this poor boy is. He's imprisoned by, the, by, by revenge, revenge as memory. Okay, now, uh, m memory as the mirror of Erised. This is interesting too. The Mirror of Erised from the Harry Potter series is a brilliant metaphor by J.K. Rowling for a psychological process whereby we get lost in the past. We, there are fond memories in the past. The present is difficult, so it's a lot easier to just try to dwell in the past as much as possible. And of course, Harry sees his parents that he didn't even know, and he, he, he loses, he begins to lose himself uh, staring into this mirror, DC, until Dumbledore, Dumbledore comes along and says, you know, you, you, you'll forget to live if you, if you stay there. Now, that's a very similar thing. It's a very similar psychological process uh, whereby the past has, has, a, has its grip on us in a very unhealthy way. So memory as the mirror of the mirror of Erised, how does that apply to Hamlet? The yearning for the obsessing over the past, the real or imagined good times, do you see? The Garden of Eden, the Golden Age, it's a trap. It's absolutely a trap. A form of escapism leading to failure of the youth or other people to achieve maturation and enter the world of responsibility, do you see? It's a lot easier just to sit there and, and remember the good old days uh, because the, the present is hard. The present is struggle, do you see? Um, so that, that those memories, those pleasant memories of the past can be like a will-o'-the-wisp. And the will-o'-the-wisp was an old uh, Northern Europe uh, uh, mythological element whereby the, the traveler lost in a swamp will see uh, light in the distance in the swamp at night uh, and they'll go toward it because I think that it's, a, that it's a, a, a dwelling of some kind but it's actually just gas natural swamp gas igniting DC so they were the will-o'-the-wisps and you can see obviously the danger of it it looks attractive it looks like it's comforting it looks like it's comforting but what it's actually going to do is it's going to suck you deeper into the swamp and, and swallow you whole DC uh, so yeah this this, this the, the mirror of Harrison again is a brilliant retelling of it of that same idea perpetual mourning for the past the good times in the past leads to paralysis in the present the past can be considered also an antagonistic trickster 
trickster gods like the will-o'-the-wisp like the mirror of erised it's a trickster it, it wants to play with us it's one of these little gods these minor gods that will tempt us uh tempt uh, it's a tempter leading the protagonist away from engagement with the present here and now so again we see the past at war with the present in conflict with the present so here we see it in hamlet we see uh, uh hamlet yearning for the good days when his father and mother were happy couple oh my goodness look at that Harry Potter yearning for the days when they were uh, uh, the family unit, the happy family unit. That's exactly what uh, Hamlet is yearning for here. So my father was so loving to, sorry, my father was so loving to my mother that he might not between, between the winds of heaven visit her face too roughly. Heaven on earth must I remember. So here's an exaggeration, of course. He remembered the loving relationship between the two and the, the father loved the mother so much that he would protect the mother from the, the harsh winds, do you see? Oh my goodness, that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, we do this, we do this stuff. So the sanitized, romanticized past is much, much better to live in than the messy present until it's not much better. It's actually much, much worse. Um, so later on in Act 3, Scene 4, uh, uh, Gertrude, uh, Hamlet is, is berating Gertrude about her betrayal of this happy past you see hamlet is still living in this happy past and he wants gertrude to live there with him isn't that interesting do you see so gertrude says you know she thinks he's going crazy and he says you know have you forgotten me he says no by by the rude by the cross i haven't forgotten you not so you are the queen that's the present your husband's brother's wife now here's where the problem comes in dc he's conflating the past and the present here what which husband is he talking about is he talking about claudius the husband now or the real the first real husband do you see so he the here's he can't separate the past from the present he wants to uh conflate the two because he has a hard time accepting the present circumstances that's not healthy that's not healthy at all so there's memory as the mirror of erised cool 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 device uh, number three, remembering the future. Remembering the future. Awareness of the passing of time is an existential burden. Now I'm going to have another video on, on the existential elements of this play. Uh, it, it is central to the play it's, itself and Hamlet's problems. We glance behind us and we see death and we glance ahead of us and we see the same, do you see? There, there's an old medieval motif uh, of this skull and it was, uh, it was uh, labeled memento mori, which is Latin for remember your future. Remember that you will die, do you see? Uh, and, and you might be familiar with this uh, from, if you've looked at any medieval art. Uh, it, it, it was part of the popular culture. Uh, death was very, very much present in the medieval times and in Shakespeare's day as well, more so than, than our uh, lucky lives today. Uh, the flower is a symbol of life, of course. This is a symbol of death, and here's the passing of time. It's a big deal, memento mori, and, and, it, and it goes to the heart of, of, of our existential crisis uh, these days. If you don't have a heaven to go towards in the West, a lot of people have, have moved uh, uh, away from religion. Uh, and if you don't have that, it's, it's, it's really, really painful. Um, so as it, with, that, with that in mind then, as a sensitive, highly intelligent idealist who wants the world to be a particular way, who, who, who insists that the world be a particular way and not the way that really is, do you see? Hamlet is appalled. He's appalled by the sad, brute facts of our existence within time. He wants to live outside of time. And there's a lot of characters in, in literature, which means that there's a lot of people on earth who, who, who are really, really offended by <laughs> offended is the word. It's like, how dare the universe be so unfair, do you see? So he's shaking his fist at the heavens and he's just insisting on what should be rather than um, accepting what is, do you see? Um, so he, here, here, here's an example of that. When, he, when he's teasing Claudius, he's pretending to be insane and he's teasing Claudius uh, where Claudius is asking, you know, where, where's the body of Polonius? And Hamlet says, a man may fish with the worm that hath eat of a king and eat of the fish that has fed of the worm. And Claudia says, what are you talking about? And Hamlet says, nothing but to show you how a king may go the progress through the guts of a beggar. Now, that's a, that's a, it, it's, it's, it's funny. He's, he's mocking Claudius here by pretending not to be serious. But because this is Shakespeare, there's a deep, deep, very sad existential truth behind this. Uh, he's teasing Claudius because he's saying that you're, you're, you think you're big shot as a king, but you're going to go through the guts of a beggar is, is what he's saying at, at the surface level. But it's, it's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty big deal. There, 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 there's a, there's a, 
there's evidence here that Hamlet is, is, is appalled by the nature of being and he refuses to accept it. And he says the same thing down here, which we're going to look at in just a second. It's the, it's the exact same motif, do you see? Um, so the question is, uh, would, would he prefer to live outside of time? In, in, would he prefer to live in death? Yes, we've seen that uh, in his soliloquies. He does have a death wish. Uh, he is suicidal. That's one solution to the problem, do you see? Uh, or another solution would be, would he prefer to live in art and philosophy like W.B. Yeats? We're going to look at a poem in just a second. He is an arty guy, as I've mentioned. He's an arty kind of guy. He's a philosophy. He lives, he, he, would he prefer to live in art? Uh, now, here, here's a, a little excerpt from the poem Sailing to Byzantium by W.B. Yeats, and he addresses this problem as well. So the, it's a beautiful poem. Go back and watch it. It's very, very interesting. Uh, so he, he, he's, he's an older man, and he's looking at all life. He's looking at the, the, the macro crowded seas and all the youth having fun and living, living, living life, 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 the fish, flesh and foul, commending all summer long whatever is begotten, born, and dies. But as an older man, he's got perspective and he can't help seeing, yes, all these young people are having fun, like little puppies in the field, but death is waiting for them, do you see? And it's, it's shocking, it's appalling. So Yeats' uh, solution is to live in art, and he says, okay, well, forget this, I'm going to go off and live in philosophy and art. And he, he, he personifies, uh, not personifies, but he uses uh, Byzantium, the city of Byzantium, as the, the golden city of Byzantium, as a place where he can live in, in pure art, D.C. Unsatisfactory, ultimately, because you, you, you really can't. But you see the problem. It's the same problem that Shakespeare's, that Hamlet is having here. It's an existential problem. It's this problem. Oh, beautiful, beautiful quote. The saddest quote I've ever heard by Samuel Beckett in Waiting for Godot. Uh, a character says, he says, women give birth astride the grave. The light gleams an instant, and then it's night once more. That awareness, that remembrance of our future, that memento mori that we cannot escape, it tortures us. It tortures humans, uh, and, and it, always, it always has and it always will. And, and, and the play of Hamlet is, is a brilliant, beautiful uh, uh, exploration of that theme. So Hamlet insists on remembering immortality. As that sensitive and highly intelligent person like W.B. Yeats, he can't help but see it. He can't just look at a field of puppies, young people having fun at the mall without thinking of what's ahead, do you see? Very, very sad. So Hamlet insists on remembering our mortality. He can't help it because of his character. That's an internal conflict with this remembrance. He intensely feels the weight of the dead past, and not just the dead past, but the dead future, do you see? So there's a few questions we can ask about this. Uh, is, is W.B. Yeats being smart? It, trying to live in art? No, ultimately he admits in later poems of his that, that that's, that's unsatisfactory because you can't live in art because you're dead. <laughs> you can make yourself into art. He's, his, his art exists on the page here, but poor old Yeats is not here, do you see? So it it's, doesn't quite work. So for Hamlet, we can ask some of these questions. Is this depth of thinking more courageous than the shallow thoughts of people like Horatio? Because Horatio says, well, let, let's have a look at that quote here. Uh, so in this gravedigger scene, um, uh, Hamlet muses on the, on the same thing that we just looked at before about how we become atoms. We're only atoms. Are we only atoms? If you've abandoned religion, then all you are are atoms, dust to dust, you see. So Hamlet says, to what base, what low uses we may return, Horatio, in our futures? He's remembering his future here. Why, why may not imagination trace the noble dust of Alexander till we find it stopping a bunghole that's basically a cork in a beer barrel? or a wine barrel, do you see? So as, uh, as exalted a figure, as great a man as W.B. Yeats, or as great a man as Alexander, will turn to atoms, and those atoms could become dust that makes part of the cork that's, that, that, that is used as a, to, to stop a bunghole, do you see? And, and Horatio, the more pragmatic person, do you see? Maybe not as intelligent, that might not be fair to say, but he says, twere to consider too curiously to consider so. Good advice, but for a temperament like Hamlet's or W.B. Yeats's or a sensitive artist or Samuel Beckett, you know, we have to, we have to face these things. And Hamlet says, no, not a jot. He's, he's going to look at it. So this play, primarily this play is about thinking. Hamlet, the overthinker, do you see? And the better part of thinking, I, I would argue, is, is remembering. Okay, so 
So we can ask the question here. So is, is he being more courageous? Is he being noble? Is he is like WB Yeats, I'm higher than all these other people that are just like puppies in a field, mindlessly having fun. Claudius, mindlessly having fun as the king. He's a big boy, do you see? And he's not thinking about the future. He's not got a poetic, sensitive soul like me. Is he being more courageous than the shallow thoughts of people like Horatio and Claudius who prefer not to think about it? Or Claudius who's too busy getting ahead in the world for the, in the present here and now, these pragmatic people? Are the sensitive artists superior to these pragmatic, I'm living in the here and now and enjoying it people? As a young romantic man myself, I used to think that perhaps the artists were superior, but now as a more pragmatic older man, I doubt it. Is it cowardly? Now here's another question too. Is this kind of, are these kinds of musings merely cowardly nihilistic escape from action? Because if nothing means anything, if, oh, Oh, okay, I could struggle to become something great like Alexander, but nah, I'm not going to bother. I'm going to play video games all day because I'm just going to stop a bunghole in the future anyway. So why bother, DC? That kind of nihilism can be a coward's excuse to eschew serious action. So in that regard, we can kind of consider Claudius even uh, a, a more noble figure than Hamlet, although, of course, he, he's a Machiavellian horrible person, but, but at least he strives. Hamlet, poor Hamlet, is stuck. Are such John Dreams musings merely narcissism and self-indulgence? So is it, is it cowardly, uh, lazy nihilism, or is it narcissistic self-indulgence and self-flattery? I'm so superior to everybody else. They're interesting questions to ask about Hamlet's relationship to, uh, to, to, to the memento mori question, do you see, to, to, the, to the harsh reality of our past and of our future. So here's where it really kicks off. This is, a, this is a lovely scene, of course, and it's all beautiful poetry, and it's all really, really true, and we need this poetry as well because we have to address this. If we're serious creatures, we can't be live like Claudius, uh, 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 merely existing for the present and, and for self-interest. We, we, a sensitive pres a, a wise person will uh, embrace this wisdom, not all the time and not to the point of, of suicidal thoughts, but yes, but it, it, it's this lovely stuff. Here's Hamlet confronting his past. This was his, a past childhood friend who is now dust. He's now a skull in his hands. Now that, that's something that, that's memento mori for you. Uh, alas, poor York, I knew him, Horatio, a, a fellow of infinite jest, of most excellent fancy, good times. He hath borne me on his back a thousand times, DC. So there's that sad memory. And we all have it. We all have it. Of course, it's lovely and sad. And now how abhorred in my imagination it is, do you see? So it, wouldn't it be nice if we could just pluck out that imagination and not think about it? Live like Claudius, a narcissist in his own right, Machiavellian narciss narcissist living without this kind of pain. He's aware of it. He's not stupid, of course, but he just doesn't, it doesn't bother him. So alas, we remember the past and the future. So here's Hamlet, perhaps an adolescent shock and amazement, not pragmatic, mature, stoic acceptance. That's what ultimately, if you do make it past the Hamlet stage, you do arrive at some point in your life as you get older of stoic acceptance. Yes, this is the way it is. I lived a good life or I didn't live a good life, but here I am and I'm doing the best I can. And say la vie, I suppose, is what we have to arrive at. But Hamlet is very much stuck as an adolescent, perhaps partly because of that Mira Vera said refusal to let go of the past that we just talked about. Uh, very, very interesting, uh, very, very important, uh, and, uh, and it's something we can all relate to. All right, so number four, shame as remembering. Almost by definition, shame, guilt, regret, all of those horrible feelings that we have from time to time are acts of remembering, DC. They're remembering our past actions, our thoughts, our feelings that we don't like about what we did, uh, and we feel shame, guilt, and regret for them. They chain us to the past, and they move us to seek forgiveness in the present, DC. So that's, again, how we are chained to the past. That's the power of remembrance and the ghosts of the past. Remembrance of his own past weighs on Hamlet. Uh, we're not quite sure what happened before the play opens, of course, but something happened between Ophelia and Hamlet, and I've, I've explored this in other videos as well. Uh, we don't quite know. Uh, there's, there's, there's a case to be made that he did love Ophelia, um, that they did have sex, uh, that they didn't have sex, that he didn't love her, DC. We don't quite know, but anyway, something big happened between them. Remembrance of his own past ways on Hamlet, causing self-loathing. So did he merely, did he not love Ophelia and merely seduce her? We don't quite know. Uh, did he really love her and seduce her? And they seduced each other, and they ended up having sex outside of wedding, uh, outside of uh, outside of wedlock, which wasn't necessarily a good thing. Is he ashamed of that? Uh, did he treat her cruelly, as is implied when Ophelia returns the letters? You know, these are remembrance 
remembrances that you gave me and, and, and you're proving unkind, so I'm going to return them, do you see? So was, is he ashamed of that? Is he ashamed generally of, of his lust and humanity's lust? He Remember, he is a bit of a Puritan. Uh, he's not comfortable in the physical world. Again, he wants to live in this artsy world, like somewhere in Byzantium, I, I, would, I would imagine. Uh, so is he just ashamed of his own general lust? And he says, he says, he says I, I, I am full of pride, I'm full of vengefulness, I'm full of ambition. He says this in Act 3, Scene 1, when, around when he's saying this. Uh, and, and so um, what... In what way was he guilty of pride? We don't quite know because it all, it all took place before the play opens. Uh, vengefulness, we see a little bit of that now. He's trying to, uh, trying to get revenge, but he's not very good at it. And ambition, we see lots of evidence that he actually is ambitious. So he sees a bit of Claudius in himself and he doesn't like it, do you see? So that's, that's he's remembering his own self uh, when he's confronted um, uh, with himself. So he says here, he says, oh, oh, the fair Ophelia, nymph in thy orisons, be all my sins remembered. So he recognizes, he's remembering his past sins and he's asking for forgiveness now. So that's how the past has a hold on him. Um, I consider myself indifferent honest, yet I could accuse me of such things that it were better my mother had not borne me, DC. So again, there's that shame, guilt, and regret. We're not quite sure exactly what the actions were or the past thoughts were, but we know that he has them. We are errant knaves all. Now, you wouldn't be able to say that unless you, you have something behind you uh, in your past that you were actually uh, ashamed of. So complex character, but, but shame is certainly uh, uh, an element of remembering, and that uh, a lot of characters in the play uh, have to wrestle with that as well, particularly to Gertrude, which we'll get to uh, uh, in, a, in a moment. But first, let's have a look at Ophelia. Ophelia's conflict with the past uh, doesn't involve shame and guilt for past actions. Uh, it, 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 it's her promises, the past promises. Promises as memory for Ophelia is, is what brings her down. She's imprisoned and enslaved by obligations to past promises that she makes to father and brother. We're going to look at those in just a second. And from Hamlet, DC. And those promises conflict with her inner beliefs, her inner emotions, and needs. Okay, so she's, she, she's conflicted, and confliction is an inner conflict is not a good thing. So this tension, this conflict, internal and external, adds to her anxiety, confusion, and it leads to her eventual breakdown and suicide, do you see? All of these promises that she makes are a, a, a little bit of herself that she gives away. She's not a fiery-spirited Juliet who can stand on her own, even though she's foolish too. Uh, she gives herself away to everybody, makes all these promises in the past, and then she's got nothing left. Uh, and, 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 and the promises that she's made don't sync with her beliefs and her needs and her desires. They go against her inner spirit, do you see? And she's conflicted. She's torn in too many different directions, and that's what, that's what leads to her breakdown, do you see? Uh, it, it really is a psychological process that is, that is, that is mappable uh, onto many people uh, uh, in, in, re in real life. Shakespeare was a wise, wise man. So uh, Laertes, at the beginning of the play, Laertes is wagging his finger at his sister and making her promise, stay away from Hamlet, stay away from Hamlet, remember me, farewell, Ophelia, and remember well what I have said to you. Now, does she, like a fiery spirit of Juliet, says, yeah, f does she equivocate like Juliet and say, fine, sure, no, she says, tis in my memory locked, and you yourself shall keep a key of it. She promises to forbear. She gives away that little bit of herself. She's truly in love with Hamlet, but she forbears goes that love for the sake of her brother's advice, do you see? Uh, very, very, in a similar vein, she's talking to her father, and her father's even more intimidating than her brother. She can tease her brother a little bit, but she cannot tease her bullying father. So uh, uh, the father insists, what has Hamlet said to you? Tell me what Hamlet has said to you. And he says, and she replies with, with a little bit of spirit. She says, my Lord, he, has, he hath importuned me with love in honorable fashion, she insists. But the father shoots her down, of course, and then she just crumbles. Now, the promises that Hamlet, I want to point out here, these are the promises of love that Hamlet gave to her, do you see? And this still tears her apart because she's not quite sure uh, what they mean. It, there's a suggestion, and I do believe that they probably had sex, but then he turns on her. They turn on each other because she rejects him through the father's demands, uh, and that causes a lot of problems. But the question remains, was this mere, what, did they really love each other? Was he merely seducing her? Did he promise? Because she says later on, you promised me to wed. You bedded me, promising me to wed, and we're not married, so she, is she betrayed in that regard as well. So these kinds of, these kinds of confusing uh, dishonorable promises, perhaps, with a total with a question mark. If we don't know, 
She doesn't know. And for us, we're just watch, we're just observing her and we're confused enough. Imagine being her where, where, where these promises are actually impacting on her life. So very, very tough. Um, here's Polonius saying, in, in few words, Ophelia, do not believe his vows. That's him saying, don't trust him. He vowed that he loved you, but don't listen to him. So what does she do? Does she stick up for her love like a Juliet? No, no, no. She says, I shall obey my Lord. So there it is. She's given herself all away. That's the promises as memory. And that past comes back to haunt her. And eventually she cracks. Like Hamlet, Ophelia has a mirror of Erised problem. Now remember, the mirror of Erised is that trap by which we can't escape the good times of the past. The past was a, was a happy time, and so the, we want to live in the past because the present is so messy. Uh, and of course, uh, we end up forfeiting our, our present lives uh, if, if we can't escape from that, those past good times. So, so, so Ophelia very much suffers from that as well. The yearning for and obsessing over past good times is a trap, a perpetual mourning for the past leads to paralysis in the present, uh, uh, an inability to get on with your own life. Past is, can be considered in this regard as an antagonist, as a trickster god tempting us, leading the protagonist away from engagement with the here and now. Ophelia can't say, okay, that was a bad relationship. I'm going to move away and move on with my life. She can't for reasons that we kind of talked about, I suppose. She has nothing left to move on to because she's given herself away too much, do you see? Promises, I should mention promises are good. I'm not trashing promises. Promises are good. It, 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 it's a very important social bond. But if you give away too much of yourself, of course, that's not good. Uh, okay, so she does have that problem. And here's some evidence for it here. So here, here's in this particular scene. Here, This is this picture, by the way. This is when she crashes after Hamlet goes completely off the rails on her she 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 laments the fact that that this man that i loved is now a total wreck she says that suck i that sucked the honey of his music vows now see this noble and most reason sovereign reason blasted with ecstasy oh woe was me to have seen what i have seen to see what i see so there's the past this this the honey of the past do you see this noble man now is down 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 she can't say wow that was terrible. I hope we can get him some help, but I've got a life I got to move on to DC. So the past joy and the present woe, she can't uh, leave behind that past uh, joy. And she says it again, there's more evidence here when she's actually, she is actually insane. Here's where she comes on and she's got the flowers and she's giving out the flowers to people in, in, in an insane stupor. She says, there's rosemary for you. That's for remembrance, DC. Do you see how important it is, how central that is to the, to the play? Uh, pray you love remember me there it is again remember me the good times she's asked she she gives it to oh, um, to laertes the remembrance but she's because she's insane she's seen it's a young male so she's projecting onto the young male uh, hamlet dc remember the good times and there's pansies there's for thoughts so memory thinking the better part of thinking is memory do you see so she can't escape the past even in her insanity she can't escape the past good times and move on into the present and say yeah the past i have to bury the past i have to put it behind me and move on to on to good times now the converse of the mirror of erised where all you see is happy things in in that mirror the, you can think of of memory as a dark mirror as well uh, it, it's a similar process but but it's the inverse so obsessing over past injustices not gazing into the mirror and saying, oh, wasn't that lovely, wasn't that lovely, love? wasn't that lovely, I hate my present, I'm going to stay away from that and stay in that loveliness of the past. You could look at the past and, can, and you can, you can, it can have a grip on you too. It's like, it's like, this was not right, this was not right, this was not right, and you can become obsessed with it and it can destroy your present as well. So obsessing over past injustices, failure to process and deal with negative past events. Traumas that were that were committed by other people on to you, do you see, uh, that, that you're not responsible for, you still have to process those and move beyond them. F find forgiveness or find acceptance in something, or you're stuck in that past. Uh, they continue to haunt you. They continue to be very, very real in the present, do you see? And, 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 and Ophelia can't do that, as we can see here. So a failure to process and deal with negative past events contributes to her mental illness, and all mental illness, by the way. We have to process the past and move past it. Conflict between the subconscious feelings and needs and the conscious promises made out of timidity can lead to dissociation. So that's part of a problem as well. Uh, as, as we have as we suggested already, she, she, in her subconscious, she needs this. 
She has desire, she has needs, she has her own self to take care of, but these, these intellectually, her brain, what she does is when she makes these promises to all these guys that we've talked about, she's rationalizing things. Okay, that's the way, it's, that's the way to do it, that's the way to do it, fine, 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 and then there's this tension, and that, that, that creates, uh, or at least contributes, contributes, actually, no, it, it creates that crack up, do you see? So here's her, here, here's, she, she, she can't process the past, and in her insane reveries, it comes out like Lady Macbeth's dream, you know, uh, sleepwalking, you know, out, out damn spot, her inner psyche is, 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 is revealed in, in this kind of dream state, and she says, she's singing a song here, young men will do it if they come to it, by cock they are to blame. So there's obviously sexual innu innuendo here. Quoth she, before you tumbled me, you promised me to wed. There's bitterness here. There's really bitter, unprocessed anger. And again, this is a clue to what happened between Hamlet and Ophelia before the play began. Uh, I do believe that they had sex. Uh, and he probably, it seems like, he, he promised to, to wed her. But maybe it's not Hamlet's fault. Maybe, you know, social circumstances. He's the prince after all, and he can't marry just anybody. He has to marry for political reasons as well. Maybe it was not Hamlet's fault, or maybe it was. Maybe he, he half lied to her. Do you see? We, we don't know. Anyway, in terms of, of, of her enslavement to the past, her enslavement to remembering the past, we can see clearly here that she's got all this unprocessed anger that she hasn't uh, uh, been able to uh, uh, move beyond, do you see? Uh, it, it's, it's quite tragic. Okay, let's look at Laertes. Laertes's Conflict with the past is very similar to Hamlet's. Um, you, you can go back and, and, and re-watch that part of the video uh, for more information, but it's basically revenge as memory. Uh, he makes promises in the past that, that chain him to the past and hijack his future. Like Hamlet, Laertes' life is hijacked and ultimately ended by a promise to avenge his father. Uh, Claudius manipulates him into making that promise, but he's, he's really making the promise to, uh, to, his, to his dead father. Revenge is a form of enslavement to remembering. It prevents participation participation in the here and now of life. Remember, like Hamlet, uh, he is, he's a student, he's got his own life to, 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 to work on, and he puts that all on hold because of the promise he makes to, uh, to get revenge. Uh, his misgivings at the end, when he's about to kill Hamlet, his misgivings suggest that er, uh, internal conflict, and again, it, it, it reinforces the, the, the tension between uh, past promises and, and, and our present lives and the needs of our present lives. Uh, so Claudius, when he's trying to, uh, when he's trying to manipulate Laertes uh, to get Laertes to be the tool by which Claudius can rid himself of Hamlet, do you see? Uh, he, he knows that Laertes is, is, is in an emotional state, and in that condition, people can be easily manipulated. And Claudius, the savvy Machiavellian, he knows that. And so he says, what would you undertake to show yourself in action, your father's son, more than in mere words? You're not just going to talk about revenge, are you? You're going to actually do it right, man. And Laertes, very decisively, he says, I would cut the man's throat into church. Do you see? That's the promise. It becomes a kind of unbreakable vow. Uh, the past is now present. As soon as you make that unbreakable, unbreakable vow, you, you, the past is no longer the past. It's actually in the present. And as we saw here, when he doesn't really want to kill Hamlet, he can't not kill Hamlet. He can't do what he wants to do in the present because it's not the present anymore. It's the past. You see what I'm trying to get at? Uh, Hamlet has, the same, has a similar problem. Uh, so Claudius, when they're, when they're planning uh, the, the, the murder here of Hamlet during the sword battle, he says, you may choose a sword that has not been capped, do you see, for protection. And in a passive practice, you can requite him for your father. So and by accident, you can accidentally st stab him in the heart or something like that. And Laertes says, again, very decisively, here's the unbreakable vow, I will do it. Comma. And for that purpose, I'll actually put some poison on my sword as well. So he's made that promise very, very decisively. He's going to get revenge, and now he's stuck with it. Even though later on, at the very, very end of the play, he says, my lord, I'll uh, hit him now. And Cla uh, Claudius doubts him. He says, come on, you haven't done it yet, you loser. Do you see how cruel he is? And Laertes says, and yet it is a, kind of in an aside. Uh, he says, here, here he is, he's saying it. He's saying it as an aside. He says, and yet it is almost against my conscience. Tough luck, buddy. You don't want to do it? Tough. You've made the unbreakable vow. Now the past is present. Now you have to do it, do you see? So trapped against its inner judgment in revenge, promise, and memory. Okay, so that was Laertes. Fairly straightforward. Polonius' uh, relationship and conflict with the past is actually quite interesting. The whirly gig of time. 
and thus the whirly gig of time brings in his revenges. So says Feste in Twelfth Night, and he says, right, we are the agents of our own destruction. What goes around comes around. We reap what we sow. The whirly gig of time brings in his revenges. What we do in the past will come back to haunt us in the present. Do you see the present? The past is always present. Uh, the Greeks personified that force as nemesis. Uh, nemesis would punish hubris. We do something in the past that's, that's hubristic, or in this case, foolish, uh, then nemesis and zeus here's nemesis and zeus here you know taking score and saying okay we're gonna get that guy uh for for his hubris for his foolishness uh yes it it it's it, uh it's certainly a, a force that we understand in our own lives uh it, it's a, it's exemplified here as well in in a short play uh, uh one act play by samuel beckett called crap's last tape it's absolutely brilliant and at the very opening of it, we have the protagonist alone in his office. He's an older man, and he's 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 doing uh, he's remembering the past, of course. Uh, and he turns. And th these are these these are the stage directions, the action. So he turns, advances to the edge of the stage. He halts. He strokes his banana. He loves bananas for some reason. He peels the banana. He drops the skin, the banana peel, at his feet. Now there's the stupid moment, the Polonius moment, something that he does in the past. And what does he do? He paces around his desk in the video that I saw with John Hurt. And then what does he do? Of course, he slips on the banana peel that he put there and he falls down. So a very, very uh, a clear indication of how stupid we can be and how merciless Nemesis is. So Polonius is haunted and destroyed by his own past mistakes and foolishness and his memory of them. He, he, he does remember them, as we're going to see shortly, but, but he's too foolish uh, for, for even that to save him. So the conflict, the past as nemesis, the past can be our nemesis. The things that we, the banana peel is our past. That's our nemesis. It's going to come back. It's an antagonist and it will get revenge on us. We reap what we sow. So we are the agents of our own destruction. Uh, Polonius's moments of, of remembrance and self-awareness and regret, he does have regrets, are insignificant to protect him from ne Nemesis's uh, judge, uh, vengeance. So when, when Hamlet goes, he, he tells Ophelia, stay away from Hamlet, reject Hamlet. Ophelia obeys, and then Hamlet goes crazy, and, and uh, apparently, and Polonius thinks that that's the reason for uh, Hamlet's insanity, uh, Ophelia's rejection. And so he says, I am sorry. Look at this, Polonius saying this. I am sorry that with better heed, that with better heed and judgment I had not watched, had not quoted Hamlet. I fear he did but trifle with you and meant to wreck you but bestrew my jealousy. So there's that remembrance, do you see? It was a teachable moment, but he being the fool that he is, he doesn't uh, learn from that and stop meddling with other people. Because the banana peel for Polonius is the meddling with all these other people. The stupidity that he does, it comes back to haunt him because it sets in motion uh, uh, all of these events that lead to his actually getting shot, <laughs> do you see? Slipping on a banana peel is one thing, but your own banana peels ended up killing you is another. Although if you slept on a banana peel, I guess you could get killed. Um, Anyway, so his past manipulations of Ophelia and Hamlet bring him into direct conflict with himself by contributing to, the, to a chain of events which end up destroying him and Ophelia, do you see? His, uh, now, this is interesting, too. We don't see this. It doesn't play out in the play because Olaertes doesn't stay away in Paris studying. He comes back to Denmark. But Polonius paid Ronaldo to spy and to spread lies about Laertes, do you see, so that he could, by indirections, find directions out, so he could, so he could get some gossip on his son, do you see. Now, if, if Laertes had been allowed to stay in Paris, those lies that were spread, those malicious lies about Laertes, might have snowballed into something awful as well. Do you see this? Do you see how it works on so many different levels? It's really interesting. So Polonius' spying on Laertes could have produced similar ill effects. We are the agents of our own destruction. We are the agents of our sons and daughters' destructions, do you see? Um, okay, so here, here's after, here's, here's Hamlet now. He's looking at the dead body. That He's regretfully looking at the body of, of, of Polonius, and he says, Indeed, this counselor is now most secret, most still, and most grave, who was in life a foolish, prating knave. So there's the banana peel. Uh, uh, um, we, past mistakes uh, end up with you slipping on your banana peels. Nemesis is indeed merciless. There shall be no more prating, no more mistakes, because you've destroyed yourself. All right, Gertrude. 
Gertrude's conflict with the past is both straightforward and quite complicated. It's straightforward because it deals quite obviously with guilt, shame, and remorse, but it's complicated because we don't quite know why she's feeling guilt, shame, and remorse. Uh, we only have clues. Now go back and watch my Hamlet conflict analysis, self versus society Gertrude video, and I explain that in a little bit more detail, but I'll just quickly point out uh, some of its key elements here. So haunted by guilt, shame, and remorse uh, uh, that is caused by the pursuit of her own interests, needs, and desires suggests that she has committed some transgression. So obviously she wouldn't be this distraught if she hadn't committed some uh, a past transgression that she's guilty about, um, worthy of such feelings, you see. So, But we don't know which. Um, we do know actually that, that she is remorseful uh, and regretful at least about the hasty marriage. When trying to explain uh, Hamlet's distraction. She says, no, I doubt it is no other than the main, her father's death and our or hasty marriage. So she admits that they got married too soon. You know, so the, she probably just, even if she did love, let's assume that she loved Claudius uh, honestly and deeply and sincerely, uh, then maybe they should have just waited a year. So there's a regret. Fine. But that's the, that alone, you know, regret is one thing, but you don't commit suicide over regret. And I'm, I'm going to argue here, or this, this film version, actually, the 2009 David Tennant version, uh, uh, their thesis is that she does commit suicide. Um, so you can, I would strongly recommend watching that video. It's fantastic. And she does a great job of, of, uh, of Gertrude. Uh, so did she commit incest? Is this why she's guilty and shameful and remorseful in the past? Do you see, it's all, these are elements of the past that are come back to haunt her. Did she, does she feel guilty about the, the incest or was that kind of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, somewhat forgivable taboo because Henry VIII, of course, committed uh, that, the same kind of incest. Uh, he married his brother's, uh, former brother's wife, do you see? Uh, is she guilty about past adultery? This is, 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 is plausible in my view, that while her husband was alive, she was having an affair with Claudius. Uh, that would be worse. That would make you feel a lot more guilty. If you had any respect whatsoever for, your, for her husband, uh, she should feel terrible guilt there, unless the husband was a total jerk, which is possible as I've talked about in other videos. Was she an accomplice to murder? Uh, I don't think, I've proved in my previous video, go back and watch that, that she wasn't, but there, it is, there, there's an undertone here and, and Hamlet accuses her of exactly that. That's something to be uh, very, very remorseful and guilty about. Uh, was she an opportunist? She enjoyed being queen and, oh, my husband's gone and I'm no longer queen, but here's Claudius who's coming over, so fine, I'll marry him and I can stay queen. That's something to feel guilty about as well. That's a shameful element uh, of, of, of human characteristics. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a shameful human characteristic, that opportunism, do you see? Uh, at least wait a year, <laughs> I suppose. Anyway, okay, so internal conflict caused by remembrance of past deeds, mistakes, and betrayals or the past that she simply too quickly abandoned, DC, uh, it leads to a suicide question mark. And again, this, this film video uh, 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 suggests that she does. Uh, so here's some evidence here. Uh, Hamlet is berating her in uh, the bedroom, the, the terribly brilliant bedroom scene. And he, and he, and he shows uh, uh, his mother a picture of both of the husbands. Uh, and he says, look here upon this picture and on this picture, the counterfeit presentment of two brothers. So the two pictures are there. And Gertrude, here's, here's where I get evidence that she does feel terrible, terrible guilt, shame, and remorse. That's remembrance. O Hamlet, speak no more. Thou turns my eyes into my very soul. And there I see such black and ingrained spots as will leave, not leave their tinct. Well, that's pretty hardcore. That's not simply, yeah, okay, I'm sorry, huh? I'm sorry, honey. We should have waited a couple of years. I do love Claudius. He's a good man, <laughs> do you see? But we should have waited. That's not that. Black and grain spot. She's guilty of something else here. Um, I suspect maybe opportunism with adultery. I don't know. You figure it out. Figure it out. I don't know because <laughs> there's very, very few clues. She's a wonderful character. I love I love the, the, the character of Gertrude and I love uh, Penny Down. This is Penny Down. I love her portrayal of it in this version. Okay, so memory is indeed merciless. Uh, Claudius, uh, at the very, very end here, here here's, here's the evidence uh, uh, that suggests that she's committing suicide. Claudius says, uh, uh, Gertrude, don't drink the poison, DC. And she says, I will, my lord, I pray you, pardon me. Uh, so she suspects th what's going on and she, she takes that poison. Again, it's, it's not firm. And the Kenneth Branagh version, the 1996 Kenneth Branagh version, has, has Gertrude portrayed as kind of a ditz. 
And that's an option too. Lots of women are idiots and she could be just an idiot that's just an opportunist idiot just floating through life completely oblivious to what's going on. But this version is more, uh, it, she, she's, a, she's, a, she's not a tougher Gertrude. She's a more realistic Gertrude, I think. Anyway, uh, we don't quite know. But regardless, past memory, torture her and whether or not she commits suicide, it certainly is torturous. And uh, as we see again, memory nemesis is merciless. Okay, Claudius is interesting too. Claudius's conflict with the past can be viewed from two angles. One, memory as mere minor inconvenience because he's a sociopath, uh, and memory as fear. This is the fear of the future thing that we've looked at in, in the previous uh, discussion. Uh, so memory as a minor inconvenience. Conflict with the past and memory of the people they hurt is not a problem for dark triad types. Now remember, go, you can have a look at my Hamlet conflict analysis, self versus society, Claudius, and I talk about this as well. Uh, he's a dark triad. Claudius is a dark triad type. He's a narcissist. He has no empathy. He's, uh, uh, he's a Machiavellian. He has no morality, no emotion. It's all self-interest. And he's a psychopath. He has all selfishness. He's callous, unemotional, uh, and remorseless. So no past. The past doesn't exist for these guys. Now, if you've seen the the, the, the series Mad Men, this is exactly what uh, Don Draper's like. Uh, um, he, he's all about moving forward. There is no past for these guys. They try. They, they, they try. And they they more or less succeed. He more or less succeeds, you see. But he's talking to he's talking to a coworker who has a problem, uh, um, and he says, "This never happened. It will shock you how much this never happened." He says, "You made this. You you made a decision. It's a momentous decision in your life. But if you're tough, if you follow my advice, you can sweep it under the carpet, and it's like it never existed." He's a, somewhat lying to himself, but not really because he he succeeds. The same thing with Claudius. What we're talking about now is the Machiavellian type. It, Claudius uh, is, is, is able to sweep the past away in the same way. And here's the proof of it. Uh, for him, the past is mere formality. Just, we'll just throw it away, take care of it, follow the formalities, and I don't have to worry about it anymore. So at the very, very beginning of the play, he's announcing to the court uh, his uh, 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 marriage to uh, his brother's his dead brother's wife, he says, though yet of Hamlet, our dear brother's death, the memory be green. Yes, he just died recently. It's a fresh memory. Yet so far hath discretion fought with nature that we with wisest sorrow think on him together with remembrance of ourselves, do you see? So the formalities, he's playing lip service to the idea, uh, to, 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 to the tragedy of his brother's death, uh, and, and then he wants to move on immediately, and he does it successfully. It, it's basically the same as this. Mad Men is it, it's a really good series, and, and, and it's Shakespearean in its depth. Um, so we've we looked at this. Uh, in, uh, Hamlet, as well, is afraid of the future. He has a memory of the future of death, the memento mori that we talked about before. So for Claudius, this, this is his only concern. He's not afraid of, he's not haunted by the past. He's haunted by his future, do you see? So memory as fear of the future. Unlike Hamlet, Claudius is undisturbed by visions and thoughts of his murdered brother. That's the past. It will shock you how much this never happened. That's a great quote. That's a great scene. Okay. Um, his soliloquy. His soliloquy doesn't address his brother's guilt. This is from the soliloquy, the, his only soliloquy, his, 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 his big one, and it reveals a lot of what he's thinking. At the very beginning of it, it seems like he's remorseful. He th seems like he's addressing his brother's murder and feeling guilty for it, but it's not. Rather than guilt... He is haunted by the memory of his certain punishment in the afterlife, the memento mori. He sees his future, he remembers his future, and he knows he's going to roast in hell because he's living in a Christian era, D.C. His only moral obligation is to himself, his self-preservation. So he says here at the beginning, he says, what if this cursed hand were thicker than itself with a brother's blood? So here he's feeling the guilt of his brother's blood, but not really. Look, is there not rain enough in the sweet heavens to wash it white as snow? He's not saying, oh, my brother, oh, my brother, oh, my brother, what did I do? What did I do? He says, no, can not can't, can't we get rid of this? Can't we deal with this? Can, can I wash this blood as white as snow? Can't we take care of those formalities so that I can live in the afterlife as happily as I'm living in the present, D.C.? Can we wash this white as snow? Um, and, what, and then he starts to dig around in heaven's terms and conditions to try to find a way to wash his hand as white as snow, do you see? Prayer might do it. That might be the wash. Is it the wash? And what's in prayer but this twofold force? Prayer is supposed to forestall us before we, make, before we fall, so it's supposed to prevent us from committing errors. But if we do commit errors, isn't it part of the bargain? 
that if we make a mistake, praying will forgive us, do you see, or pardoned being down. That's what prayer is supposed to do. It's got a twofold force, do you see. So he's digging around in heaven's terms and conditions, trying to find a way out. He's, he's self-serving. So again, there's remembrance. It's a ghost of the future in this guy's case. He's Cain, Cain and Abel. Cain kills his brother uh, Abel, and he's remembering his future in hell here. So there it is. And that was Five Quote Shakespeare, Hamlet, Theme and Conflict Analysis, Remembrance, Self versus the Past. I hope you found this video useful, and if you did, don't forget to like and subscribe, and pick up a copy of the PDFs if you need them. Thanks for watching.